Hey everybody, Dave Altavilla for Hot Hardware here, and welcome back to Two and a Half Geeks, our semi-weekly webcast. I guess we try and get this out weekly, but but maybe not so uh, regularly at uh, at the weekly mark. But uh, welcome, and uh, with me is uh, are, are some friends. We have Marco Cipetta and William Van Winkle, who uh, is a published author, a general uh, all-around. Um, well-written guy in tech, and um, we we dub him the half geek, but I don't know. I think that's kind of a, I don't know. I think that's selling him short. So, uh, but but good to have you guys with us, Marco, William. How's it going? Going good. No complaints here. Excellent. No. Thanks for having me. Right on. You know, Marco just got back from the from the West Coast, where where things were decidedly more. More warm than than our northeast climate. Uh, how'd you like it out there in California? IA? It, it was good. I, uh, I attended the uh, Game Developers Conference (GDC). I got to meet with uh, all of the all the big companies that we like to track here at Hot Hardware. I had some some FaceTime with Intel and Nvidia. Saw some cool stuff. Some cool stuff from Synaptics and AMD unveiled their VR headset out there. So lots of cool stuff. Very good. Very good. And William, wh where are you? Specifically, you're in you're in California, right? Or where, where are Close. you? Uh, no, I'm I'm about 20 minutes west of Portland, Oregon. Oh, or, oh, that's right. Whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's close. It's, it's almost coast. California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, different latitude or something like that. But uh, what, what's what's it like out there for you? We've got uh, just to give you some perspective. Now you're talking about a couple of guys that feel like we've hit a um, a time warp or a, a, a you know a, a location warp to Siberia. We've got like four and a half feet of snow here. What what do you got going on out there? What do I got? I got uh, coming up on sixty and sunny, which is really weird for this time of year. Ah, uh, this is this is how we say it in Boston. You bastard. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I'd fix it if I could. <laughs> All right. We'll uh, we'll cut the idle chit chat and uh, get down to some tech because we got a lot of tech actually with with Game Developers Conference going on and um, let's uh, let's dive right in. Uh, there are a bunch of announcements um, from various players and a few uh, interesting reviews we've had up this week on the site. So let's let's talk some tech. Um, Marco, I don't know what order of preference we want to go in. Maybe maybe let's let you jump in first since I've been mouthing off for a while here. Um, uh, why, don't, why don't you dive in with uh, with what you saw from Intel, right? The, they had some some interesting new stuff in the land of Nux, and we're not talking the Three Stooges, right? Yes. Yeah, so if you come by the site, we have a few Intel-related articles you'll probably want to check out. So this week out at GDC, Intel had a small event, not quite. They, they had tons of stuff happening on the show floor, but I attended a smaller private event where they revealed some new hardware and some new uh, initiatives to further the game industry. So. Something that's really interesting, we don't have a ton of details on it other than what Intel told us at the briefing was they have a new socketed Broadwell-based CPU coming. It will be unlocked, and it features Iris Pro graphics. So that's a big deal for a couple of reasons. One, there were rumors a while back that Broadwell would never see desktop systems, that it would only be in small form factors, notebooks, and all-in-ones. But there will be a socketed version, so that's the first thing that's cool. The second is this is the first socketed CPU with Iris Pro graphics, and that's also cool because it's an unlocked CPU. So I'm assuming this is going to be an enthusiast processor because it's unlocked. That means that desktop enthusiasts will be able to plug in a Broadwell CPU, you know, slap on a ton of cooling, and see what kind of super high clocks not only the CPU, but Iris Pro graphics can get. So that should be an interesting chip. That's coming in the middle of this year. And they also revealed a, an upcoming NUC system. So the NUC is the next unit of computing. That's Intel's little tiny small form factor systems like this one. You can see how small they are. Oops. I was, no, I was screen sharing there. Hold that up again. <laughs> Here it is. So that's the little guy. Now the, the one that they... This is the... Let me see if I get the name right. This is the NUC 5i5RYK. We recently published a full review with benchmarks and video of this guy, so come by the site and check that out. The one that Intel revealed at GDC is a, a full quad-core Core i7-based NUC, also with Iris graphics. So this little tiny system, it's taller than the one I just showed you. It's the same, you know, about four inches around, four inches square. They're looking so at it right bit, now. Yeah, it's a little bit taller. 
This machine has a full quad-core Core i7, again Broadwell-based, with Iris graphics, uh, support for M.2 SSDs and all the goodies that's in the machine that we reviewed. So you're talking fairly high performance and a little tiny form factor with that guy. Now that system, I'm told, I will have one very soon and they'll be available in April. So as soon as I have one, I will test it out and we'll get something published up on the site with uh, with full numbers and everything like that. Uh, I want to jump in here because I'm a little bit, I'm going to be a little bit of a of a doubting Thomas here. I'm 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 wondering because we saw a previous version knock like devices um, from the previous gen from Haswell with integrated Iris Pro graphics, um, and that thing you know when when you got something with Iris Pro graphics in that form factor, um, it sounded like a small hair dryer was was plugged in when it was under load. What do you think we're gonna get with with Broadwell now? Obviously a a 14 nanometer process now versus 22, uh, much lower power processor core. Um, Iris Pro Graphics uh, also. I, I don't know if they made the if that made the jump in in the shrink. I don't I don't think it did, right? No, it's going to be Iris Graphics in that machine. Yes. Right. No, I understand, but but did it make the jump to 14 nanometer? That that block. It must have. Yeah, it must have. Yeah. Okay. So, so so maybe we don't have the hair dryer. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna. St- I didn't hear the system, but let me let me do something here. I'm going to pull this one apart. All right. So this is the current Broadwell machine. You can see it's a bottom comes right comes right off, and this is what's inside. So you know here's the, the memory, here's the SSD, the processor and cooler is on the other side. Now you see that other machine is going to have more volume on the Z height. So it's going to mostly be for a cooler and to accommodate a two and a half inch uh, SSD, I believe. Mm-hmm. So you're going to have more height for a cooler. This particular NUC, not dead silent, but super quiet. So I'm going to say my guess, because I haven't heard it, is it's going to be quiet, not silent. You will hear the fan, but I do not think it's going to be like the Haswell based, where it really kind of couldn't fit in that small form factor. I think they're going to get this one right. I don't think they're going to do the same thing twice. Yeah, I, I think you're probably right. I remember we we fired up uh, there, and there are a couple of different types of devices. Gigabyte had a had the Brix Pro with Iris Pro graphics, and uh, I remember firing that up back on the previous generation, and and that thing under load was was loud. I mean, for for a little cube, it, it made a lot of noise. And but I think I think the jump to 14 nanometer has been very kind to to Intel, and uh, this could be the platform of of choice to to get into this. Tiny little box that is just screaming, screaming what? Home theater PC to me, William. What? What do? You, what do you think? What do you think a, a little device like this could could do for the average consumer? Are we talking, or are we talking, you know, more of a, a business play? What, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, it's got the Visa mounting, right? So clearly, it's it's targeted at Visa and fleet deployments and stuff like that. And I, I think it makes sense there. Uh, at home, would I would I want one in my office? Yeah, no, probably. Uh, I'd have a hard time justifying that with my my need for expansion and peripherals and and all that. The thing that this makes me wonder about to to flip a question back at you is, you know, why this instead of an all in one? Uh, as you point out, that this thing starts at four hundred bucks. Um, you know, does does this form factor make sense for consumer circles at all, or or are all in ones good enough? So can I answer, Dave? Yeah, jump in, baby. So I I, I look at these things kind of, I don't know, I, I wear enthusiast glasses all the time. So part of me is like, there's no way I would want a little system like this. But countless people that I deal with, countless, family, friends, whoever, and I'm sure you guys have the same thing. So many people that you know buy systems and never touch them. They never open them, they never expand them, they never change anything. Fewer and fewer people are using optical drives. And a core, this even this one, so this is a Core i5, This I built it up with eight gigs of RAM and a fast SSD in there. <clears throat> it is plenty fast for a huge swath of the population. And people that don't touch their systems and don't need an optical drive, I think they would be perfectly happy with a little tiny system like this. Now, with that said, there's tons of other, you know, opportunities. Home theater PCs, obviously, digital signage uh, opportunities in these little tiny form factors, um, just POS systems where you don't have space. So it, there's kind of lots of different angles. I think the consumer desktop space is skeptical, like you just were. But if 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 they used one. And realize, you know, and they don't need the expansion. There obviously are people that need the expansion, but 
if the type of user that's going to buy a system and never touch it, I think would be happy with it. Yeah, but yeah. That's, that's the question, right? I mean, if you're not going to touch it, why have the extra box? Why not just have one piece and build it into the screen? Well, what if you already have a nice monitor and keyboard that you like? You know, if you if you don't okay. want to, if you want certain input devices, or the all-in-ones don't provide the type of screen size or resolution that you want, then you have the flexibility to change those other peripherals or keep what you have if you just want to replace a tower. Sure. Okay. I I think I think there's definitely um, a use case in the home. I think there's a, a big use case in the enterprise and in education for machines like this, uh, kiosks. Um, there's there's a lot of, of use case out there, and obviously Intel's continuing this this product line and to evolve it and to and to expand upon it. And so there's, um, you know, Intel doesn't stay locked on a design very long if there's if there aren't dollars to be had. Uh, so so clearly they're making a, a you know a market case for it, a business case for it. Um, but yeah, I, I my my first reaction when I ever see these little boxes is home theater PC, stick it right in there next to the stereo component. Plug it in, um, you know. It's going to stream. It's going to do whatever you want. You know, whether it be audio, maybe you want to stream some Pandora, or do some you know, stream some movies, Netflix, what have you, and offer a little bit of gaming too. Um, you know, by the same token, you know, I always think that, and, and I never really get into. And I know there's some people that are crazy home theater people, and they have you know terabytes of movies on on you know storage servers and all that good stuff ready to go. I've I've never done that. I you know, I, I get these things in there, they they're they're good for a couple of weeks and then I get you know, I get bored and <laughs> go back to my full system. I don't know. So one more quick little corner case. You mentioned home theater PCs. It's they're it's kind of expensive for a home theater PC. You don't need this kind of horsepower now unless yeah. you know you can output native 4K on this little thing. So if you are one of the lucky few with 4K display and you want some actual 4K content, there is a lot more online than there is out in the store to go buy. I don't think you can actually buy anything. I'm not, I haven't really looked. But if you want native 4K output, you can do it with this little guy. So that's another small you know, slice of the population, but you can do it. Sure, yeah. It'll actually get you to the land of 4K sooner. You'll actually be able to find some content. Hey, Dave, can, can I jump in with one quick question here? Yeah. You, you and I were talking before about Iris graphics and, and sort of where that stood against discrete GPUs. Marco, I haven't got your opinion on it yet. This little box, if you're going to use it for a, a broad assortment of things, obviously the, the graphics matter. Are, are Iris and Iris Pro good enough now to, the, that we can stop worrying about, do I need a low-end discrete chip in this thing? Is it where it needs to be? So the, this particular iteration of Iris Pro, I don't know where it's going to perform. I am assuming it's going to outperform the previous gen, it, just you know, based on what I know. Uh, and the, the previous gen Iris Pro absolutely was uh, more than capable of, capable of competing and even beating some low-end discrete GPUs. The, the, the difference is, is in Intel software support. They've come a long, long way in terms of driver compatibility with games and other things. They are still not on the level of an AMD or an NVIDIA in that regard. However, People using discrete, I mean, uh, integrated graphics, I don't think are going to notice or care most of the time for the things they're going to do. So you d absolutely do not need it, it, a high-end GPU is obviously going to outperform it, but versus the the low-end, you know, sub fifty dollar, fifty dollar GPUs, it's absolutely in that league and can outpace some of them. Cool. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I think we're there now. It's uh, it's amazing to see that we've finally gotten to good enough, if you will, on integrated graphics. Um, you know, there's a little bit of game going on, uh, not not for the heavy duty gamer, but for the casual gamer for sure. Um, so let's let's move on uh, now that we've we've touched on the the gaming topic. Uh, let's talk about what Nvidia announced uh, out at uh, GDC, and um, Nvidia's CEO uh, flamboyant and uh, likes to make an appearance. Uh, Jensen Huang uh, actually stepped up and um, offered. A, 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 an unveiling of a product that we've been waiting for since CES, actually. Um, they stepped out back at CES in January and announced Tegra X1, which is the follow-on to Tegra K1. Tegra X1 is a system on a chip, full system on a chip, with uh, a an 8-core, 64-bit ARM core plus NVIDIA's special sauce graphics engine on board. It's actually a 256-core Maxwell 
GPU that's on board Tegra X1. So it's their next generation Tegra product, and um, you know it seems like they were well. We actually saw some demos. It didn't seem we actually saw some demos. Performance was scaling uh, 2x that of the previous product at least. Um, just seemed like a very potent chip. But one of the things that we sort of left scratching our head was you know that their their demonstration vehicle to pun uh, you know use a pun or uh, what have you. Uh, <laughs> was actually an infotainment and uh, control and machine vision application for vehicles, for cars. And they demoed, a, uh, showed a lot of tech demos on, uh, on the Tegra platform in, in cars, and that was the application, the, the use case. Um, and we sort of left, you know, hey, that's great, and, you know, there's a big automotive play there, and God knows it's really cool to see cars getting more intelligent and real-time recognition, some pretty impressive, interesting demos, by the way, real-time recognition of... Uh, different vehicle types and, and um, landscape and, you know, just mapping the world around you. Um, and very impressive, but we were kind of like, okay, where's the consumer play? And because that's sort of the big driver that you always expect with these low-power chips, these ARM cores that they're developing in NVIDIA. And at GDC is when we finally learned what that, what that uh, consumer play was going to be, and they announced the Shield console powered by Tegra X1. I'll see if I can screen share this for you now. Share this out. And so here you are looking at uh, Tegra X1. It is as thin as a uh, as a tablet, uh, maybe a, a premium tablet, if you will, sort of mounted in a, a slot style stand. Comes with their Shield wireless controller. And again, there's, there's Jensen. You can just, you can take a look at the size of this thing. You know, fits almost in the palm of your hand like a seven or eight inch tablet slides into its little dock there, and there you go. That is the Shield console. Now this is an interesting little device. It's you know again powered by that new that new SOC, so it's it's got some some pretty good gaming chops on board for sure with with Maxwell graphics. Um, but it's 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 you know it's it's everything that an Android device can do today and terms of Android gaming and, and all different apps and software and what have you that that is in the app ecosystem but it also is capable of uh, handling Nvidia services as well including Nvidia's new grid uh, game cloud uh, cloud gaming game streaming service and um, also you know some pretty cutting-edge titles that they were showing off as well uh, on the uh, on the Play Store, so they're they're bringing in their developer clout, you know, their relationships with developers um, to to bear in, in in bringing these you know first rate titles, these top top end uh, leading edge titles, game titles into uh, the Android ecosystem into the into the Google Play Store, um, and then of course it also does game streaming from a GeForce enabled PC to to the shield as well. So now you're talking about a device that, again, it's a, you know, it's a set-top box with Google Play Music and videos, you know, for movies and all that good stuff. It's a console for Android gaming. It's a console for potentially higher-end Android gaming with these new games that are coming. And they they went through a bunch of different titles. Um, one of them was the uh, what's the the prequel? Uh, what's the one I'm thinking of? What is it? Borderlands. Borderlands, thank you. Uh, Borderlands prequel that, that's coming. You know, a bunch of different cool, uh, cool game titles coming down the pipe for this thing, as well as game streaming from a GeForce-enabled PC, which literally takes, you know, top-end DX11 titles and allows you to stream to this device onto your TV from your computer from a from a powerful gaming PC. So. What do you guys think about all this, um, Marco? Let's get your take first, and William, let's let's get your take as well. But I was impressed. I think they've got a challenge because they're sort of carving out. They're setting their sights on some pretty big guns, and they compared this thing to let's just you know call the example that they that they used two x the power of an Xbox 360. Um, so right there, they're they're already targeting the game console market, which is that's a big big nut to crack. What do you think about this, Marco? I I really like it. First of all, that's so. Let me let me start out with saying I think <laughs> Nvidia is doing some very cool stuff lately. I thought the Shield Portable was a pretty awesome little device. I don't know how well it did for them, 
I thought the Shield tablet was the best 8-inch tablet I've used. Not sure how well that's done for them. Looking at the specs and what we know of X1, I'm fairly confident in saying this will absolutely be the most powerful, best Android TV streaming device yep. with the added benefits of the true 4K encode-decode at 60 hertz plus all of the gaming stuff. So you're looking at what will probably be the best Android TV streamer with plenty of gaming chops. Now, some of the stuff in video... It, it was it was clear, but not quite perfectly clear at the event. Lots of the games they showed, the Borderlands, the Doom BFG edition, the Crisis 3 multiplayer map, all of that stuff they showed was running natively on this device. It wasn't streaming, so it was capable of smooth 1080p frame rates natively running these Android apps. Plus, you have tons of cool Tegra-optimized games already. So in terms of what the device itself can do, it's pretty powerful, and the demos were compelling. It was nice. And on top of that, the Grid game streaming service um, it is the best game streaming service available. There are still some latency issues to contend with, depending on time of day or where you are, but you have full PC titles. They just surpassed 40 titles that are available in there right now, and there's no installation. If you want to play one of these PC games, you go to the grid service, click it, less than a minute, you're playing one of these games with no big installation. So that's a cool user experience kind of thing. All of this cool stuff doesn't necessarily add up to success, though, as we've seen with some of the other products. So I'm not sure. I know personally I would, I would love it. I know I'm going to like it. It's just cool. Unless they break something between now and launch, it seems like it's going to be nice. Um... I, I hope they pull off something great. What about you, William? What do you think? I think the thing looks amazing. Um, I love the idea of having fewer devices I got to manage. I, I like that it's an all-in-one, kind uh, kind of like the the Nook platform, uh, you know, a little bit. Uh, it gets us a lot closer to to not needing a, a bunch of extra stuff. But we've seen, you know, several consoles come and go. Uh, that, that's my biggest concern here is, is there room in the market for a new contender? How much value are they actually adding over what we've seen before? And is it going to be enough to get over that initial debut hurdle? You know, that's, that's what I don't know. And I guess, um, I guess the launch strategy will have a lot of say in that, right? I think, I think you hit the nail on the head right there, William. Um, you know, it's funny. We got, we got a little bit of chatter on this uh, article when we launched it. Um, a lot of folks positive about it. Certainly the technology looks promising. Um, Tegra X1 itself is a powerful, uh, low-power processor. Uh, pretty cool with all its different capabilities that NVIDIA has enabled here. But people were like, is this Ouya 2.0? And, and, and that thing failed miserably. And, um, you know, what, what's, what chance does this thing have? And, and that's kind of, I think, the key here. I, I, I really think... You know what? What Nvidia's challenge is is not so much the technology because clearly they've got that. I mean, the processor is is impressive, the platform is impressive. What they can do with uh, grid game streaming. I mean, you know, and you look at some of the titles that they've launched. You know, 50 plus Android launch titles that they've they talked about, which don't sound like Android games. And you look at things like Borderlands 2. Um, you've got uh, Portals in here, Half Life, um, Grand Theft Auto. Um, there's there's a bunch of um, you know different triple what you call triple A titles, uh, not not just you know Angry Birds and stuff like that. <laughs> so so that's impressive, but it's it's really going to be I think what what Nvidia can do in the back end, partnering with their their developer uh, ecosystem with their developer network to get this thing out in the mainstream. It, it, do they have the juice? And I I think they do. They certainly have more juice than the folks at Ouya do or did. Um, and do they have the juice to deliver this thing and get this thing into the channel so that it makes an impact? But to your point, Marco, I wonder how many Shield tablets they've sold. I wonder how many Shield gaming portables they've sold. And we could look at those numbers. I'm sure they're out, they're out there. But it didn't seem like they knocked the cover off the balls off the ball with, <laughs> with those uh, devices. I, I, I lapsed into my New England Patriots uh, ball uh, deflate gate, I think. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a question mark. What do, you, what, what do you think, Marco? Can they, can they deliver on that front? So I think NVIDIA's got probably the best DevRel team out there. Like, they probably work closest with 
game developers than any other company. Yep. You know, at least in, in the space that we cover. Um, I think NVIDIA's in position to own the game streaming market. It's it's their hardware. Other, other people are going to use their hardware, and they have their own service. And it's the best one I've tried. So there's a possibility that in the future NVIDIA owns the game streaming technology. Maybe not their brand in there, but their tech is probably going to own that space. As I said before, it's probably the best streamer, Android streaming device out there. And I think their, their messaging is going to be important because, yeah, you know, the console space is it's, it's crowded with, with Sony and Microsoft in there, and those are the two, well, I guess you should count Nintendo too, those are the brands people think of when they think game console. But the other thing, the other takeaway is if you're a PC gamer and you own a huge library of games, you can now own a console and not need to buy those games again. All of them will stream over, almost all of them will stream over to this device. Right. So if you've been wanting the opportunity to go play on your big TV and don't want to move your PC or don't want another PC in the other room, boom, you've got it with this. You, you, you ha buy this console and you have access to all of your existing titles and the best library of games available, which I personally believe is on the PC. So there's there's tons of opportunity. That the marketing and the positioning and and how big the launch is is, is going to make an impact. And I, I think NVIDIA could do something here. History has not has shown that despite releasing some really nice products, maybe they don't explode onto the market, but they're trying, and I think they're going in a good direction, and I, I see what they're trying to do, and I like it. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I, I, I think for for them, grid is key. Um, I think it's great. The people that are in the know to, to stream from your PC, from your GeForce-enabled PC, is an awesome feature. And, and guys like you and me, you know, I don't have time to game anymore, but if I did, <laughs> I would I would love that. I, I would, you know, that is, that's a huge hook. Unfortunately, you're talking about mainstream appeal here. And not everybody has a GeForce in their uh, GeForce GPU in their in their desktop that can stream. Um, not everybody kind of gets that, you know, either. You know that that technical hook of okay, uh, I'm connecting this thing over my internal network and it streams a game from my PC and my PC's rendering it. And you know that for the average Joe or Jane maybe that it might be not so easy to wrap their head around. So there's a little bit of a challenge there. But if you start delivering a ton of titles on grid and you can make that you know a latency free experience that's pretty huge I think that's 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 a real good um, you know feather to have in your in, in your cap there for to make a case for this thing yeah to, to think about it another way and like these are all things that people the market's gonna need to understand um, Jensen had mentioned that the goal is to have triple-a titles in the grid store on day of launch because it, it is going to be a paid service so there'll be a basic free subs subscription level it's not exactly clear what people are going to have access to but the the free version will be like 720p streaming at 30 hertz and then the premium will be 1080p streaming at 60 hertz right but picture buying a PC game triple-a game on the day of launch and now you have it on you have it on your PC and your shield so it's you know, there, there, there's an advantage there. If you buy it for Xbox or PS4, you have it on just that device. Now you can get these AAA titles and have access on your PC or the Shield. Sure. So that's kind of cool. There's, there's, there's lots of questions. There's also the opportunity, you know, if they set something up in a Best Buy, if somebody's buying a 4K TV and they want a 4K streamer, this is it right now, <laughs> you know? So yeah. there's, I think they could partner with some people. I don't know. I, I'm just talking out loud. They could partner with some, you know, TV manufacturers. Who knows? There's lots yep. of opportunity. It, it, it will probably be the most powerful Android TV device for quite some time. Yeah, I think I think that's you know, there's a whole lot of evangelizing that needs to go on with this thing, and I think that's their initial their initial hook is you know if you're considering smart TV, Android TV, Apple TV, any of those smart TV devices, Roku, what have you, why just stop at a, at a dumb streamer when you can have some serious horsepower uh, and 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 game too? So. And the answer yeah. is always the answer is always money. This thing is two hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah, right. Versus what? What is it? Ninety nine or seventy nine? Maybe yeah. for the lowest streamer, right? Yeah, I mean you can even go cheaper with like a Chromecast if you're using something else, you know. Sure, right. Of course. Yep. 
Well, it'll be interesting to see if they can pull it off. Let's uh, let's move on to some products from HP. We want to talk about a couple of different products from HP. And Marco, I'll let you dive into the HP Spectra X360 Ultrabook. You took a yeah, look at it this week. This right? is um, I, wow, what a machine! Let me let me pick it up. So <laughs> here, here it is. This is the. Let me see if I can get a good angle here. This is the X360 top. That is the bottom, one large vent like Dell. I know well, William is probably going to ask how the venting is, <laughs> how, how thin it is. Um, the, the top and bottom machined from a single piece of aluminum, and it is a fully articulating hinge. It can go all the way into tablet mode. Just a beautiful machine, and, and I think I want to show this. So right now, this guy is completely off. So let me turn it on. Watch this. So off, I'm hitting the power button right now, power button is hit. Is it turning on? Did I hit it long enough? Okay, HP logo, Windows logo, uh, desktop. That thing just booted from cold to wow. desktop that fast. <laughs> yeah. I was thoroughly, thoroughly impressed by this machine here. The keyboard is also gorgeous. Um, and this touchpad, first of all, look at the size of that touchpad. Huge touchpad. You would think with something that big in front of a keyboard, it's annoying to use, tons of you know uh, false touches. But HP worked with Synaptics on this thing. The palm rejection is awesome. I, I tried to trick it because that drives me nuts when I'm typing and and you know you hit the touchpad with your palm and it messes you up in whatever app you're working in. I couldn't fool this thing to to recognize my palm. It was that good. So. HP has done so many cool things with this. So let me just get some specs out of the way first. Um, you're talking about a Broadwell-based Core i5-5200U. The machine I tested had 8 gigs of RAM, also had a 256 gig Samsung M.2 SSD, and of course it was a touch display with a full 1080p resolution on this model. 3.2 pounds in this configuration, and the dimensions, let me see if I have it in front of me, 12.79 inches by 8.6 inches by 0.6 inches at its thickest point, but it, it, it is a wedge, so almost nothing at the front, little more than half an inch at the back. And again, fully articulating so you can do regular clamshell mode, stand mode, tent mode, and full tablet mode. So. Tons of functionality. Every every USB port is USB 3. Every USB port does charging, so you're not fumbling to figure out which one can do charging when the device is off. If you think about every little detail you sort of want in an Ultrabook, this has it. The only two sort of negatives that I t take away from it, having seen devices like the beautiful XPS 13, there is a lot more bezel around this screen, but you need that if you're going to be in tablet mode. You need a place to put your thumb when you're holding it. And the fan, the fan does spin up to audible levels. I wouldn't say the machine is loud, but if you want a dead silent notebook, um, this is not it. Under load, you can hear it. But other than that, absolutely beautiful machine. In the configuration I looked at, it is 999, which is also pretty competitive. There will be a top-of-the-line Core i7 model with a Quad HD screen and touch. I believe that one was 1399. And there will be a lower end one with a um, smaller SSD and four gigs starting at eight ninety nine. So beautiful machine all around. Yeah, impressive. Um, you know, I'm thinking about the price point, and it is about a hundred bucks less than the average similarly spec MacBook Air. Yep. Um, I think probably it's spec better than the average MacBook Air. If I'm not mistaken, I think that's a sixteen hundred by nine nine hundred screen on the current gen. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's very competitive, um, and and the performance. You know, it's funny. Uh, I I think we're going to start seeing more of this 256 gig or, or or maybe even the 128 gig variant Samsung SSD make it into these these new ultra books that are that are coming to market with with Broadwell on board. Um, we got Dell's XPS 13 in, um, and that SSD the M2 SSD that was in that device, I, I think it was a light on or something like that, it was okay, it was fast, and it certainly boots almost as quick as that HP machine, I think. Um, but that Samsung SSD that HP used, and Dell has an option for that as well in the XPS 13, that thing is so snappy. Um, yeah. It's it's just a notch above everybody else. I want it. Does that thing, did you take a look at that in Addo or any of the, the disc benchmarks? Because I think that thing hits like, 
a gig read or something like that, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Let me jump to the page. I don't. Let me, let me just jump to the graphics. I don't remember the number, but it is a PCI Express M.2 SSD. It's not. Um, it's not limited by the SATA interface. Right. And let me. I'm trying to find it. I think it's on here. Yes. So the SSD in this machine did 753 uh, megabytes per second average. You know, which is what is that, 50% higher than the average SATA SSD. So that is the part of the reason it performed so well throughout our tests. Um, a couple of more points I should make. 56-watt-hour uh, battery in this thing. So they, they, I have a picture of the motherboard with the battery. HP kind of put as much battery in here as they could without making it too thick. So it was the best battery life we've seen in an Ultrabook yet. And, you know, some of this is marketing, but in the briefing I got for this device, HP really seemed serious in, in making premium in every aspect. They said they worked with all of the hardware partners, including Intel, including Synaptics for the touchpad, and tried to optimize the software stack. And they said they even they identified situations where changing the load order for certain drivers sped up boot times um, and also, you know, improved performance. And I think... Now, those are improvements that will come with everybody because Intel did make changes to their drivers that all Intel devices will get, but HP was a facilitator in this discussion. They also worked with Microsoft to make sure they were doing things right in terms of touch and um, optimizing for Win 8.1. And all told, all these little things they did seem to come together in a really great device. It's, it's so nice. I thought I wouldn't see another notebook after the XPS 13 this year that I would love to own. I would love to own this thing. I really like it. Wow, wow, that's a that's a big statement. So almost 10 hours of battery life and in our web browsing test, which frankly is a robust web browsing test, we hit some some pretty heavy duty pages with Flash and all that good stuff. So it's really t it's actually taxing the system probably more so than the average bear. So 9.5 hours or something like that, uh, almost 10 hours, uh, or excuse me, yeah, nine hours and 50 something minutes. Um, and so, William, what do you think? Are you jonesing for this now versus your... I know you're an XPS guy. I look I, at it. I like it. I, dang, you know, I really like that near bezel-less display on the current Gen XPS 13. But what, do you, what are your thoughts? Well, I love the, the near bezel-less. It, it, it's great. Um, this unit at, at three and a quarter pounds, it's a little bit heavier. But, you know, for the battery, that's a fair trade. I'll take a quarter pound for the extra battery. Um, yeah. I, I don't mind having a little extra bezel, it's sort of like, you know, when you, you have artwork, right? You, you got a frame. Um, bezel, bezel is is fine. Um, I, I'm okay with that. Uh, one question I did have was the audio. You know, uh, you get a lot of ultra books that beef up the audio. You've got some good post-processing that really gives you that, that big sound and a little extra bass. How is the audio on this? Well, audio is actually pretty good. So they didn't partner with anybody like Beats or anything like that, but and let me see if I can if this comes across on video. The the bottom it is curved, so it's not perfectly flat. There is a curve along this edge, and the speakers, the grills are on either side of the curve. So even if this is down flat on the desk, you're not completely covering the grills. And the volume and clarity is what you'd expect from something this small. You're not going to fill a room with booming sound. But in terms of quality and richness, um, surprisingly good for the size. The audio was good. That's cool. Well, there's Christmas. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. Hey, so let, let's move on to another HP product. And um, actually, you know, you, you talked about the speaker system. Um, this sort of tipped me off um, to, to, to mention this as well. But... Um, uh, let, let's talk about the HP Omen 15. We're running a little bit long right now, but the Omen 15 uh, is HP's um, gaming uh, from their from their gaming division, the the Omen uh, series, if you will, and uh, actually comes from an acquisition they made of Voodoo PC back in the day, and uh, they still continue that that uh, that branding, that Omen branding for their gaming products or their gaming targeted products. So we took a look at the Omen 15, their current generation. Uh, product, uh, their notebook, and it uh, actually is based on the previous generation Intel processor now, uh, the Haswell Core i7 4710HQ quad core, specifically 2.5 gigahertz base, 3.5 gigahertz turbo on that. Uh, so it's not Broadwell, although I think they'll be revamping it uh, in the coming uh, days, uh, you know, down the road uh, for Broadwell. Uh, but it's an interesting machine. I'll, uh, I'm going to screen share it out here and let you take a, a peek at it. Um, 
it is um, it's a thin and light machine as you can see it uh, it actually weighs just under five pounds uh, 4.68 pounds looking at the specs there thin and light machine 15 inch 15.6 inch display um, resolution is 1080 uh, 1920 by 1080 which again for me on a notebook I think is plenty um, and as you can see it has let me scroll down to the video here has lots of, of lighting bling so you've got your standard backlit keyboard but it's also dressed up with um, these uh, what they call omen effects or uh, a lighting scheme you know very much like the voodoo PC uh, capabilities of, of days gone by and now you've got I think it's six different zones in this that you can change the lighting uh, including the speakers in the front there that you can see on the wrist rest area those are actually the speaker ports that um, will will even flash to the beat of of the of the music you have on board, which by the way is powered by Beats Audio. Um, so Beats Audio speakers, you've got some some cool lighting bling that you can change uh, to different hues. Um, you know on on the spectrum, a, a number of different colors in six different zones, including the A W W A S D keys for for gamers for for first person shooter types. And um, you know, so a nice setup. Um, but uh, I don't know if I had that presented to everybody. Could you guys see that on the screen? Hopefully, you could. I, I saw um, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but for for me, what what let what fell short a little bit, just the, the gotcha I had right out of the gate, was the speaker system. Um, actually, this machine, um, while impressive in its uh, build quality and and its design, and it looks fabulous. It's really really nice and thin. We'll talk about that. The speakers fell flat. Um, they they did not compare actually to Dell's XPS 13, which I thought I impressed the heck out of me for for the size machine that is, uh, less than three pound device. I think it's 2.8 pounds on the Dell machine. Here you've got a near five pound 15 inch notebook that you would think would have a little bit more thump. Um, actually sounded thinner and not as loud as the Dell uh, XPS 13. Um, with its Beats audio. So, you know, what are you going to do? I've never been a big fan of Beats anyways, frankly. They've always sounded a little tinny to me, whether it be their buds or whatever. I haven't put a set of Beats cans on in a while, but the buds always sounded that way. So, you know, I guess that was the one gotcha I had. Other than that, um, this is a machine that is a 15-inch notebook that's still under 5 pounds, 4.6 pounds to be exact, and it performs... Um, much more akin to a gaming notebook. It's a it's a thin and light ultrabook style machine. Um, really nice um, sort of uh, machined aluminum finish, but uh, flat black painted with uh, textured uh, finish on the on the on the top and then on the bottom. Uh, there's some neat you know grilling and venting that goes on underneath on the bottom of the device. I wish I had it here to show you. Um, so it's set up really well. It's really premium build quality with all that that different glitz. On board with uh, with with the lighting and all that good stuff, um, and it plays, you know, it games like, you know, frankly, a machine that probably weighs a lot more. Matter of fact, we compared it to Lenovo's, I think it's the Y70 uh, gaming notebook that weighs in at like seven pounds and change, and this thing actually beat it in a couple of spots. Um, same GPU, interestingly enough, GeForce GTX 860M mobile graphics chip. Um, but a discrete NVIDIA GeForce chip on board, 512 gig SSD, PCI Express SSD, so that was lightning fast as well. And um, priced as tested with a, with a 512 gig SSD now uh, at $2,099, so a little bit pricey. Although a base configuration starts at $1,295 if you look at places like Amazon. Um, so nice machine. Um, what are you guys' thoughts about this? To me, it's, it's sort of a tweener product. It's 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 got some gaming capability. Um, it's it's not gonna hold up to the same kind of battery life um, watermark that you'd put out there for a thin and light like like this um, with with ultrabooks with the standard ultrabooks. But it's but it's got more horsepower on board, so that's the trade off. Yeah, I mean, I I like the idea of a product like this. You're you're talking thin and light, beautiful build quality. Um, some of the cooler, you know, gamer-oriented features plus the discrete graphics. Um, I, I think they did a nice job on it. I personally w take portability and battery life in my notebooks. I want something that's going to last as long as possible and be as thin and light as possible. Um, so for me personally, I would take something like the X360 over this. 
But somebody, I, I think you, you, you say it properly when you say it's a tweener product. If, if you don't want a huge, monstrous gaming notebook, but want a thin and light machine that has the juice to play games, it's a perfect contender right there. Yeah, yeah. Are there, are there lots of those folks out there, William? I'm sure there's quite a few. Um, you know, I'm trying to think. <laughs> there's, you know, would I take this for myself if I did more gaming? Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's got the horsepower. It, it's definitely sexy looking. It might be a little over the top for you know somebody of my my age. Um, <laughs> you know, in terms of all the the, the bling, but you know that that's okay. Um, the, I am curious. Did you get a chance to throw a, a decent? headset on this thing and, and uh, you know you said the speakers weren't that great uh, but you know the integrated audio any any feedback there yeah no unfortunately I, I didn't get a chance to do that um, I did suggest that actually as part of uh, our video coverage uh, to to you know hook the, hook it up to a Bluetooth speaker system or, or drop in a, a set of buds to, to you know up your your audio quality um, I, my my guess is, you know, you're talking about Intel platform architecture. It's probably pretty good. I I don't think you're going to be short there. I think the preamp on it's probably pretty solid as well. This is a this is a machine that is not for want so much for real estate. So I think the circuitry is going to be fine. Uh, but that would that would be a you know speculation. Uh, frankly, did not test that out. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting product. You're talking about a 15-inch notebook that that weighs far less than five pounds and can still put up, you know, 60 frames per second at 1920 by 1080 res and like Batman for a, you know a, a cutting-edge DirectX 11 title. So um, not too shabby. Uh, and you're playing at the native res of the panel in this case. You know, you're not talking about a 4K display that we're starting to see in all these fancy ultra books now. I don't think you need that for the average notebook, frankly. I, I mean, I think there are a few folks that really need that kind of screen real estate uh, or, or want that sort of pixel density. I think a 1080 display, even in a 50-inch machine, is fine. And this thing, the cool thing about it is, can actually game at, at native res. So you're not you're not getting that. Um, you don't have to deal with that concession in, in uh, uh, playing outside of the, the window of uh, the native resolution of the panel. You don't get that loss associated with that. So that's kind of nice. Um, but, yeah, it's it's an interesting product from HP. They seem to be firing again. We, we seem to be um, getting a, a little bit more, you know, touch, you know, tap on the shoulder from the guys at HP and the, and the folks at HP now saying, hey, check out our products. And uh, they're, they're firing again. That that Spectra X360, Marco, you were impressed with it. The HP Omen 15 is an impressive product. And uh, I guess, welcome back, HP. It's good to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then we'll, we'll finish up real quickly on the, on the gaming front. Marco, I'll, I'll let you dive into this real quick, even though it was earmarked for me. Um, let's talk about the Titan X from NVIDIA. Uh, talk about over-the-top graphics and um, product offering here from, from a company that's been doing it for for a long, long time, this thing's out of the park, right? Um, I, we'll, we will know more very soon. That's all I'm going to say about that. We'll know more about exactly what makes up the Titan X very, very soon. But, yeah, I was out at GDC. I went to a talk um, with the folks from Epic, to the, the state of the Unreal Engine talk. And Tim Sweeney's up there speaking and, and you know, jokingly, well not jokingly, he, he's talking about the need for photorealistic rendering and says, but we need much more GPU horsepower and then jokingly says, is there anybody that can answer that call? And in walks uh, Jensen Wong of NVIDIA with a box wrapped up in a jacket and he comes up to the front of the room and next week, or I guess the week after next, NVIDIA has their GTC conference, conference coming up, the, uh, the GPU technology conference, which is where they would traditionally announce something new like this. But Jensen, uh, in his wisdom, pulled out this box and opened it up and launched the, or at least announced the uh, GeForce GTX Titan X right in front of us there in the room. And all he disclosed was that the GPU is comprised of 8 billion transistors and the card has 12 gigs of frame buffer memory on it. In the pictures in the article, you can see it looks just like a GTX 980. Uh, safe bet, this is the real big Maxwell GPU. The GTX 980 is the, the mainstream sort of middle size chip if you historically look how NVIDIA releases GPUs. So it should be a, um, a monster performer all around and we'll be able to tell you more soon. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> so there it is. I'm showing it off to the audience right now. 
Uh, 12 gig frame buffer, 12 gig of RAM. So we've seen previous generation NVIDIA GeForce Titan products clocking in at well over $1,000 at launch. With 12 gig of RAM, people are speculating this thing could be anywhere from two to $3,000 at launch. What do you think? You, th you think we... Are we looking at a three thousand dollar graphics card here? This, I mean, just mind boggling to think that. But I don't, I don't think so. Um, so the the three thousand dollar card was a dual GPU triple slot monster. This is a well, I, I'm not sure. I'm assuming. Um, I'm speculating. I, I'm pretty <laughs> sure it's going to be a single large GPU. And memory, yes, it is a cost adder, but not a huge cost adder. You see, you know, uh, AMD's now uh, pimping these eight gig are 290 cards, and they're not crazy expensive. So I, I think you're going to see a card that is more expensive than a 295X2, the dual GPU AMD card. I don't think it's going to be that crazy price of the dual GPU Titan. I'm not sure. Who knows? I mean, if, if NVIDIA's got an absolute AMD killer here that just dominates everything, they can charge whatever they want, and they're going to sell them, um, at least to the hardcore gamers. I don't think they're going to go with that insane pricing route on here. It is going to be a premium product. It's going to be uh, NVIDIA's flagship, so you're going to have to pay for it. But I don't think it's going to be nuts like the dual GPU Titan. William, would you spend 1000 or more on a graphics card? <laughs> God, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, you, you're asking me, and I'm not a, a hardcore gamer, you know, for productivity apps and, and you know, the, the media stuff I do around the house. Do I need that? No. No. Um, you know, am I looking forward to how that technology is going to filter down two years from now? Yeah, yeah, I think it'll impact me, but it's a ways out. Yeah, yeah, impressive stuff. Good to see Nvidia continuing to push the envelope. Wondering what the what our friends from AMD are going to offer next. We know that their next generation is on the horizon. We've heard some rumblings, um, but right now Nvidia seems to be firing. They're firing in the low end, low power space with uh, with Tegra X1, and now. In, in the high-end uh, big guns graphic space with uh, Titan Titan X, lots of X's going around. They must be on a an X kick, I guess. Racer X, Titan X, Tegra X, <laughs> but all good stuff. So um, I think that about wraps it for today, guys. We we are um, we are hitting the hour mark. But um, anything else to offer before we sign off to our faithful viewers? Yeah, let me just jump in one second. There, there was a ton of stuff happening this week between MWC and GDC, plus we had a bunch of reviews recently. So come by Hot Hardware. We have a review of an awesome Samsung external SSD, a Lenovo all-in-one machine, uh, one of Asus's new ZenBooks we took a look at, plus all of the mobile news out of N M MWC with the, the, the Galaxy S6 and S6 Edge. Uh, there's tons of stuff to see, so we can't uh, we can't cover it all in this podcast. So we want you to come by the site and check it out. Stop by hothardware.com. That's where you'll find us. Uh, hothardware.com, or you can stop by hot uh, youtube.com/slash hothardwarevids. That's our YouTube channel. Like us here, of course. Uh, thumb up this video if we were entertaining enough for you. Um, and let's see, facebook.com slash hot hardware and twitter.com slash hot hardware if you want to catch up with us there and. Talk to us in 140 characters or less. William, where can we find you, buddy? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm kind of <laughs> invisible, uh, to tell you the truth. I <laughs> do a lot of corporate writing now. Um, I mean, is, is it okay to talk competitors? Sure. Okay, well, so you know I, I write for Tom's Hardware and Tom's IT Pro. Um, I do a little bit with Computer Shopper, and uh, a lot of my stuff now is corporate. I've got a website at williamvanwickle.com. Stop on by, check them out, and uh, thanks for being with us folks hothardware.com and stop by actually probably in the next couple of weeks we may be doing a little giveaway of sorts may team up with one of our friends at uh, either Nvidia or one of the other vendors and we usually try and give away some pretty interesting stuff we've given away tablets before um, lots of different stuff full gaming systems you never know when we're gonna launch a contest so stop by and uh, you could get in on the action there as well thanks for watching everybody and have a great one